we've got Talia, Deep, Ibrahim, and what's interesting about all of them is they represent firms that actually really don't need any introduction at all. Sort of Bessemer is a firm that has been around probably longer than any other venture investing practice, um, dedicate, like, dedicated investing practice in the world. Um, SoftBank is a firm that uh, everyone talks about, whether it's in hope that they will invest in one of our companies, in fear that they will invest in one of our competitors, or in admiration for the way that they invest. And Mubadala represents sort of a unique perspective. There just aren't that many global sovereign wealth funds that invest on the scale that you guys invest, both as from the point of view as of an LP, but also as a VC who runs around the world. And I think what's extraordinarily interesting about the way that the three firms have operated is that you've, from the beginning, thought globally, in your case, 100, 100 plus years ago. And so maybe we can talk a little bit about <coughs> the firms, and then we'll spend a little bit of time talking about geographies and how you're thinking about either expansion or your presence. And then we'll spend some time talking about where you're investing. And so, Talia, sort of your sort of a fairly new partner. Talk a little bit about how Bessemer thinks about global investing. Sure, so thanks so much for having me. It's so great to be here. Um, so Bessemer, as you mentioned, is one of the longest standing venture capital firms um, in the world. Started uh, uh, over 100 years ago. Um, but we've had the fortune over the past even just 50 years to be involved with a number of uh, industry-defining and category-leading companies um, and over 120 different IPOs. But the way that we view the world um, and, and that we view investing is that we want to be partners and be kind of long-term partners that help lay the foundation for entrepreneurs that want to create um, enduring, long-standing, and category-leading businesses starting from seed and, and series A um, on through growth and, and beyond. And so we invest across stages and we also invest across geographies. Um, we have offices here in, in the Silicon Valley, in Redwood City and, and San Francisco, in New York, in Boston, in India and in Israel, but our investments kind of <clears throat> expand far beyond those geographies alone. And Deep, you reminded me in our call that SoftBank Division Fund has actually only been around for a little bit more than <coughs> two years. How's that possible? <laughs> uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me here, and uh, you know, there's a unique bit of history with both my panelists' firms here for me. Uh, I learned about the world of venture capital and private equity in a class uh, in business school at Harvard 20 years ago from Felda Hardiman, who is a partner emeritus uh, at Bessemer, and probably one of the hardest but teachers that I had, but from whom I learned a lot, and hopefully will become a good investor one day, uh, as good as him. Uh, and Mubadla, who obviously you know, gave us a start along with our other uh, LPs as, as the Vision Fund uh, more than two years ago. So I'm, I'm in great company here. Uh, in terms of the fund, you're right. The SoftBank Vision Fund is a little over two years old. Uh, we have uh, you know, deployed 80 plus billion dollars during that time. Uh, in 80 plus companies uh, around the world. And we, you know, about 40 plus percent of our investments have been in the US, but about 40 percent in uh, Asia and about 15 percent in, uh, in Europe. So we are already global from the get go, and that's been our remit. SoftBank as a firm has been around for over 40 years. And while our primary business uh, has not been investing, we've always been investors during that time. Uh, you know, some of our more notable investments uh, that people here might recognize. Uh, we were the f earliest investors in Alibaba. That stakes worth over about $100 billion today, and we are the largest single shareholder in Alibaba. Uh, we were also early investors in Yahoo, continue to hold uh, our Yahoo Japan joint venture that we did with Yahoo at that time, and uh, continue to be the largest shareholders there, and many other such investments uh, over the last four decades. And Ibrahim, you have a unique sort of view and a unique organization. Talk a little bit about what you're doing and sort of yeah. how you guys play. So, uh, morning. Golly, how long has Bessemer been around? 
112 years, something around that, wow, so give or Be take a few years. Yeah, Bessemer's been around longer than the, uh, uh, than the United Arab Emirates as a country. <laughs> so when I hear this, it reminds us to be uh, humble and grounded no matter how big uh, we are as an investor. So uh, as, you, as you saw from the short video, uh, Mubadla is a, a, a global investor. And uh, really what happened about three years ago, um, you know, we're large investors in these industries around the world. You saw vi pictures of uh, mines and uh, manufacturing facilities and, and uh, oil rigs, uh, lots of stuff that many people here in this room don't really think about. But as we've seen technology really start to change all these major industries uh, and really impact our industries, our decision uh, three years ago was really how do we go from a defense position to an offense position, uh, where <coughs> we wanted to start becoming much more active in technology, and not just technology at a large scale, um, because that's also an important part of our strategy, uh, but technology um, in an early, engaged manner. So when we made that decision, then the, the next important decision for us was, um, okay, how do we go do that? Uh, what's the strategy? How do we set up? Um, what's the community plan? And, and most importantly is, uh, what's our partnership strategy? Because uh, we couldn't just show up and say, hey, we're, uh, we're here, we're gonna do ventures, and we're going to identify the best founders um, it took us a lot of really hard work over the past three years identifying the right partners, building the team, uh, putting in place the processes to make the right decisions, uh, getting comfortable with making investments that potentially don't pan out, something that was just a very different um, mindset and approach to what Mubadla has been used to. Uh, so all these pieces had to come together. And the reason why we believe this was important is you know, ultimately, we wanted to be very consistent uh, with the founders, with the great founders, with our partners. We wanted to identify them early, partner with them early, <clears throat> and then find a way to work with them as they scale and grow uh, globally, because there is no local technology company today. Uh, so with these great founders early on, the message we give them is, we understand that we have to start in a place a magical place like Silicon Valley, uh, but ultimately um, your company can be as global as any other big, large company. And Mubadla is uniquely positioned to partner with you as you grow globally. It's interesting because both of you have started something relatively recently, and you've made strategic decisions around how much of a presence to have in Silicon Valley. You know, sort of, I'd be curious, maybe we can go this way, starting with you, Ibrahim. You know, sort of how big is the presence in Silicon Valley compared to the rest of the organization? So it's, uh, listen, we started small. We have a team here on the ground, um, uh, a team of 15 people. We have uh, an office, um, and we get up every day, and we're a part of the venture community. Uh, and that's what it's all about. We meet founders, we meet partners, we meet technology companies. Uh, we, Guests come from all over the world, we host them. Um, it's really, again, it's about strategy and community, so how are we very well integrated uh, into, and, over, and, and we've observed sort of a shift over the past three years. In the beginning, there was a lot of questions, and, um, and, and some cynics were saying, listen, we, just, we don't understand why a sovereign wealth fund like Mubadla would want to invest early. Yes, uh, but at the same time, we won't do uh, we won't invest the way, I think I saw uh, my good friend Samil here uh, with Haystack. We won't do what Samil does at the seed stage, um, or what you do at Bloomberg Beta. Uh, but at the same time, we can potentially start working with these founders early on and potentially invest in some of these follow-on rounds at the A or the B round, um, and then provide them the, the power and the scale and the scope that they need. So to do that, really, you can't just fly in, um, have a meeting, and then tell the partner or the founder, uh, we'll catch you in six weeks when we're back. You know, there has to be sort of this very iterative, consistent approach. And you have to fight for the founders. Um, and recently, you'd have to fight with a lot of the other VC firms, just given how competitive it's become uh, here in Silicon Valley.
Sure, sure. Deep, you set up this organization fairly recently. How big is the presence here, and how does that compare to the rest of the vision and fund? There's no question that if you're going to invest in technology companies, you need a presence here and an important presence here. So we have uh, probably over 60 investment professionals in the Bay Area. We also have a large presence in London uh, for the European markets. Uh, in Shanghai, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Tokyo, as well as in Mumbai for the Asian markets because they are very widespread. Um, it makes sense to be here. I mean, this is where the action is. I came here two decades ago to start my own company and have stayed here and have been involved in uh, you know, Google from the early days as an operator there at LinkedIn in the early days and uh, now at SoftBank in the early days uh, as an investor. This is where businesses get built. There's no question about it. Yeah. What about you? So Sil Silicon Valley has always been a really important nexus and center for Bessemer. Um, but I actually started my venture career in our New York office, and I came to um, our San Francisco office about four years ago. Um, and I think I was, um, I think I underestimated even, you know, how much pixie dust to some degree there is of just being at the center and the heart of um, of Silicon Valley in the sense that. There's just this love of entrepreneurship that spans kind of industries and people here. And I don't know many other places in the world that you can like send a cold email to an entrepreneur that's built a really big business um, and they'll meet you for coffee mm -hmm. and, and share advice. And so that's something that's really special and I think is unique um, to some degree to Silicon Valley. But Bessemer has always had the perspective that entrepreneurship um, sees no borders and geographies and that actually some great businesses are built um, all over. And so um, for, for, for decades, kind of we've been backing entrepreneurs that, you know, even at the early stages and at the seed and series A stage that started their companies outside of Silicon Valley and, and companies like Shopify in Ottawa, Canada, MindBody in San Luis Obispo, um, uh, Procore in Santa Barbara, like these are not what people typically think of as like the hotbeds of, of, of innovation and, and technology, but they've built some of the most um, impressive and enduring businesses that have gone on to be kind of billion dollar leaders in their categories um, and, and far beyond that. And um, um, we want to make sure that we're going wherever the entrepreneurs are and that we can provide a great um, Series A early stage kind of network and foundation um, um, and deliver it and bring it to those folks as opposed to saying like, hey, you need to come to Silicon Valley. Great. And so now that we've said good things about Silicon Valley, we can talk about the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. um, so before I ask questions of the panelists, I'd like everyone to go back to their app, go back to their phone and go to venture4.app and answer this poll question. The next frontier of tech innovation is most likely to grow on which continent? And I'll let folks do this as sort of, you know, I would love to hear your perspectives on, so where are you focusing around the world, you know, sort of outside of the U.S.? Um, I guess maybe we'll start with Talia. Talia, you know, sort of I was just emailing with, I, I was in Shanghai, Ethan emailed me, said that you guys were in Beijing. You guys have not had a presence for a little while. How do you think about where are you looking next? So, so Bessemer, we have offices um, where we're kind of very active in, in India and in Israel, and those are kind of really important geographies for us, As and, and we've made many investments across Europe. In fact, Bessemer's had a, a multi-billion dollar exit in Africa um, in a company called Steltel, so we really have had this, this very global perspective. Um, we haven't been active um, for, you know, quite some time, over a decade in, in China, um, and there have been, you know, no doubt there's been an incredible amount of, of value created in, in China over the past decade. Um, and, and we believe there will continue to be enormous value created and, and that, um, especially in, in areas like software and enterprise and um, in AI that um, historically um, have been less mature markets in China. Well, they're actually like um, maturing quite quickly. And so we're trying to go um, and spend more time really just learning and trying to um, better understand, you know, what is happening in the ecosystem. Um, can we have a differentiated perspective um, and, and bring kind of value there and, and, and learn and, and share some of our learnings from the U.S., um, but also um, take learnings from China. And I think what, what I've realized personally is that um, Many times now, there are businesses um, here and, and, and 
and locally that are actually inspired by businesses that are being built um, in China and, and overseas. And that um, it's sort of a way to, to foreshadow in certain areas and see like, hey, this is a different model. This is an area that can work. Um, and, and so I think it's really important and helpful to have that global perspective. Yeah. I mean, I guess, Deep, you've got this view. Like, you see the whole world right now, and yeah. you get to allocate your resources. Where are you spending more time, and where are you asking your folks to hunt more? So, you know, we hunt everywhere where, where there are great companies. In the last three weeks alone, uh, I was personally in Asia, in Scandinavia, in Southern Europe, on the East Coast, and here. Because uh, there are interesting companies in many different parts of the world. There is no hegemony of any one region. Uh, uh, no monopoly over startups or great technology companies. Uh, having said that, you know, there is obviously a lot of activity here. Uh, there are ideas that I exchange across the continents, but also now more and more, one of our investments in China is a company called ByteDance. And while most people in the U.S. wouldn't know ByteDance, they would probably know TikTok. Right. Or if you don't know TikTok, you know, anyone in your family who's a teenager will definitely know TikTok. Uh, in India, it's like taking the country by storm, right? It's sort of like the new phenomena. And that's not an idea that was imported by some other company. It is a Chinese company in the consumer space broadening <coughs> out. That is highly unusual. And I believe that we're going to see a lot more of that. Uh, and we have to pay attention to uh, those trends as well. In terms of our investments, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we almost have an equal distribution uh, in the capital that we have uh, deployed in the last couple of years between Asia and the U.S. And in Asia, it's not just limited to China. We have you know, amazing companies in Indonesia, in Korea. Uh, of course, in India, we have a lot of exposure. Um, and soon in other parts of Southeast Asia as well. Uh, because great entrepreneurs uh, are now not limited by any region. Uh, we are only limited by the ideas that we can fund. Right. And for you, Ibrahim, you see, you get to both decide what companies to invest in all over the world, but also what new managers to invest in all over the world. Yeah. How do you think about all of that? So, uh, you know, our approach, uh, James, is, is this, again, I think our partners, um, their approach of funds and, uh, and individuals within these funds is we respect that. I think that has its role in the venture world. But for us, we look at this, uh, the whole model as a system uh, because we started as a global company and then we decided to sort of move to local franchises and local systems. So then how do we uh, really get this whole system to work together is fundamentally what uh, we spent a lot of time thinking um, and developing. So yes, we started in Silicon Valley because this is the most intense uh, place um, for technology. This is the most active, uh, just magical in its own way. Uh, then we have taken this model. We're replicating it in Europe. We've just set up a team in, in London and expanding some fascinating opportunities in Europe. We just invested in a company in Berlin. Uh, Yes, our parent is an Abu Dhabi-based firm, but we've also taken that model and just established in Abu Dhabi because we're seeing some very exciting entrepreneurs in the region, and I'll, in, in the Middle East region, and I'll give you some examples. And we also invest in China more on the later stage. But really, it's a, it's a very uh, global approach. Uh, the biggest challenge for us, and I'm sure a challenge for firms like SoftBank and Bessemer, is how do you really get the system to work together? Mm -hmm. Right? How, do we, how do we support an entrepreneur who wants to go from Europe to the U.S. or a Chinese founder who's really excited to potentially tap into Europe? Uh, so that level of coordination and developing a system that works is a big challenge that we're constantly uh, working um, and improving. On your question around sort of <coughs> GPs, LPs, listen, the GPLP relationship has never been closer. Uh, I think it's transforming. It will continue to change. Uh, we're not the kind of LP where we'll just commit to a fund and you'll send us a quarterly report and we'll show up once a year to your very nice LP event. Uh, we are a GP and an LP that's very active, very engaged. We want to support you. Our best LP relationships, and we invest uh, in seed funds, pre-seed funds, post-seed funds, and here in Silicon Valley, I think there's like pre, post, uh, all sorts of uh, all sorts of categories. So there'll be developed. Series A. Post Series A funds. Yes, and, and, and we, even, we even invest in funds like SoftBank. 
but our most, uh, and not all relationships have worked. Obviously, it's a journey. You test and you refine, and, but it's very personal. Uh, and the team here is engaged with these funds. Uh, we sometimes compete with them, and that's okay. I mean, so we just as long as there's sort of a maturity and an awareness and understanding that in some cases we'll partner, some cases we'll, we'll compete. And we want our, our LPs, our funds, uh, to contact us and to reach out when we can help them. We don't want you just to call us when there's a deal that you think we can invest in. So I think there's also the really uh, a creative, smart, thoughtful, and visionary uh, funds are starting to say, okay, how do we change the relationship and the dynamic with, a, with, a, with an LP like Muwadla? Mm. And that's, I think Ibrahim brought up a very important point uh, in terms of globalization. It's not just about investing in a company in a particular geography or region, but it's the ability to help them grow globally. I mean, there has been no important technology company that has been created that is just limited to their particular country, right? Mm -hmm. Even if they don't have a huge presence somewhere else, they will have business in other parts of the world. And that's where, uh, at least at SoftBank, that's one of our key value adds to our portfolio companies. Uh, obviously, we are long-term patient capital. Uh, we are freedom-level capital for many of our founders. We share their vision, we amplify their ambition, but through our ecosystem that has been built over four decades, we enable them to go to different parts of the world. So whether it's companies like Oil Rooms that started in India, but we helped them grow in China, we helped them grow in LATAM, and now they're coming to the US. Uh, whether it is, you know, Didi and Uber working together in uh, China and us enabling that, whether it's Garden Health uh, that we are helping and Katera that we are helping get in the Middle East and work with our, uh, you know, partners in Abu Dhabi, Emirates, and KSA. Uh, these are real fundamental accelerants for our portfolio companies, and that's a key value add because, as we all know, Great companies, no matter how great they are, they have windows of opportunity, and you need to try and grow as much as you can through that window of opportunity. Otherwise, there are all kinds of companies coming into your right. space. So if, if I just I want to make one comment, just and, and then I'll stop, I promise. It's around this. And Deep mentioned um, there's this magical system now with SoftBank that enables all these, supports all these companies. And if you speak to the SoftBank founders that SoftBank has invested in, they'll tell you sort of how SoftBank system helps them. And then there's this window of opportunity of, I don't know, five years, six years. But understand, these companies are moving into countries now where these technology companies are impacting their transportation systems, their healthcare systems, their food systems. So there's a significant amount of regulatory burdens and, and systems they have to deal with. So it's not, oh, let's just go set up a website or let's set up an office and launch. So the ability to support these companies as they grow and emerge in different countries, you really need different kind of investors, a complementary set of investors that work together. That's why the likes of the really smart founders would choose a Bessemer and a SoftBank and a Mubadla, or would choose a Haystack or a Collaborative or a Sequoia. All, it's just how do you really bring these different funds together to support? We can't do what great Silicon Valley investors do in terms of sometimes evaluating these companies or investing early on and taking a point of view, but we can help founders scale and grow globally much better than many of the Silicon Valley investors can. I mean, I think along those themes, one of the things that you pointed out to me was that for the Vision Fund, you know, almost 40% of it was focused on ride sharing, and in some ways, the system that's been created is this unique place and time where capital is available and global expansion is available. And it'd be interesting just to chat for a little bit about, so what's the next ride sharing? What's that next big theme that's going to sort of be dramatically accelerated because it is such a good fit for this sort of company? Um, Talia, Bessemer is famous for putting together its roadmaps. You had a couple of ideas around this and sort of would love to get everyone's ideas after that. Sure. So um, what's the next ride sharing? <laughs> Uh, where's SoftBank going to put the next, you know, 40% of, of the 100 billion? Um, maybe Deep will tell us. But, um, you know, a few things that I'd, I'd comment or um, um, observe is that there, there's another category that sort of already has some very similar dynamics to ride sharing, and that's um, in, the, in the food delivery space. And I think what you're seeing is these markets that are um, massive markets, you know, everyone needs to eat, everyone travels, um, where there's... Um, 
massive global opportunity and to some degree this, this network effect and, and a land grab dynamic where capital um, can play an important part in, in accelerating the development of, of those businesses. And, um, and I think we've seen it with DoorDash, with Deliveroo, with you know, Swiggy, um, a bunch of different companies in, in various geographies, uh, many of which I think have been funded by, by folks um, uh, to my left. <clears throat> but uh, beyond that, I think one of the, the areas that I think uh, is interesting to think about um, from that perspective is, is real estate. Um, real estate, another area, you know, everyone uh, needs somewhere to sleep and to live. It's the largest area of consumer spend, like what you put towards your mortgage or towards your rent. Um, housing prices are increasingly unaffordable. Rent is increasingly unaffordable. Um, and how do we rethink, um, rethink real estate? And as a capital intensive business in and of itself, like these are physical assets, like what better um, area and ecosystem for kind of large global funds to really help support. And so if I had to place a bet, that would be my, my bet on the next ride sharing. Deep. Uh, you know, obviously uh, we've invested quite a bit in, in all the areas that Talia has talked about. Uh, fundamentally, if you take a step back and look at why we raised the kind of capital we did, it, it was based on two key insights. Uh, one insight was that, you know, unlike the last 50 years of technology development, when every decade there was one particular technology that really took off and as a result generated a lot of investment opportunities, we are living in a very unique decade at the moment where it's not one, not two, but three different technologies that have mm. all come of age. So, you know, 30 years ago that might have been the internet, then came broadband, then came mobile, but today all of a sudden it's all of those three, they still continue to move forward, but then you also have AI, it's definitely come of age. You also have robotics, it's definitely come of age. And by robotics, I'm not just talking about, you know, uh, things like Boston Dynamics, which actually have robots, but self-driving cars are robots, you know, uh, UAVs that people are talking about and drones that people are working on, those are robots. Uh, the things that power Amazon warehouses, a lot of them are robots. So robotics in an industrial sense has come of age. And finally, the third place is genomics. And that's completely changing the way we live. We take care of ourselves during sickness and you know, take care of our well-being and health, uh, as well as the things that we build, the materials that we have, the clothes we wear, et cetera. So when you have three amazing changes, step changes happening in technology all at once, it just generates so much more opportunity to invest. So that takes a bunch of capital. Then a second fundamental change is happening in the world as we speak, which is all these vast swaths of GDP across the world, whether it's real estate, whether it's healthcare, whether it is financial services, transportation and logistics, they are all undergoing massive digitization and massive globalization. Now, you cannot take on you know, the railway system with like $100 million in capital, right? You need a few billion dollars. You cannot take on one of the large uh, massive banks like a JP Morgan that has a trillion dollar balance sheet with mm -hmm. like $200 million in your balance sheet. You need a few billion dollars to do that. You cannot take on the entire real estate industry that thrives on the 6% you know, commissions for like just showing you things uh, and becoming your therapist during the process of the largest purchase, <laughs> right? Uh, and that has to be disrupted. But again, you, you cannot take over you know, hundreds and of thousands of agents and companies that have been around for such a long time uh, through someone like Compass and mm -hmm. technology just with $100 million in the bank. So that is the other place where vast amounts of capital can be deployed very, very productively. And uh, you know, in your opening statement you mentioned is like, do you admire us, do you fear us, do you wonder about us? Uh, and one thing you left out, but I know is implicit, is people always think of us as people with big paychecks. And I always wear you know, these socks, if anyone can see, <laughs> to remind us, the, the, these are dollar bills that, have, that are flying, okay? And everyone, if you're in the investment business, congratulates you when you close a deal. Because they're like, congratulations, you just closed Slack, you just closed Garden Tell, you just closed Katera. And that's dollar bills going away. That's not <laughs> what our LPs like Ibrahim are happy about. It's the other sock that they're happy about, which are dollar bills coming back in into our LP portfolios. And that's really the reality of our life as investors, right? We have to invest 
but we have to really focus on the returns. And if you invest smartly in global megatrends that are happening, and if you do it with the right kinds and amounts of capital pools that are at your disposable, with the support of the best LPs you can find, then I think you have a lot more dollars coming back into the system. And that velocity of dollars just increases global GDP mm. as a result of that. Mm. Now, for you, Ibrahim, how do you take advantage of some of those trends in building, you know, you've got also this unique chance to build unique infrastructure, right, in Hub 71. How do you do that and how do you bring that talent in and, and those ideas to make it successful? Um, <clears throat> Thank you, Deep, for bringing the dollars back. Uh, that's really important. <laughs> what many people, Five IPOs already. Yes, what, what, <laughs> what many people don't know is when you commit such a large amount to the Vision Fund, which like we did, uh, it's not, we're not waiting for three funds before you distribute capital back. There has to be also a very thoughtful and smart way of distributing capital back uh, to the LPs. So for us, uh, you know, what, we're, what James is referring to is this platform we built in Abu Dhabi called Hub 71. Hub 71, 71 refers to the year the United Arab Emirates uh, was formed as a nation. Uh, and Hub 71 really is our platform in Abu Dhabi to accelerate a startup ecosystem and not only to support talent in the UAE and in the region, but also to attract talent from all over the world. We can't do that alone, so we leverage Mobile Less Global Network. We leverage SoftBank as our partner. All our partners in Silicon Valley, in London, in Beijing, uh, in terms of how they can support us to really look at the region as also an important growing opportunity for technology companies where you have five, six, seven hundred million uh, people that live in the Middle East and North Africa, over 70% that are under the age of 30, that all want to do and live and have the opportunities that we here in this room do. So to do that, we need the government, we need the entrepreneurs, we need the talent, we need the capital to all come together and say, how do we make the changes um, the UAE has emerged significantly over the past 40 years, but how do we make the real changes to take us for another 40 to 50 years? And, and those changes have to be significant, and, and we have to approach how we run uh, the country and how we invest in our talent in a different way, because talent has really emerged and changed uh, given technology. So that's a, it's a new initiative, and it also for our partners in all over the world, it also demonstrates, and they get excited when we tell them about Hub 7, but it also demonstrates that we're also uh, thoughtful about our country and how we want to support entrepreneurs in our country. We're not just deploying capital in different parts of the world and really ignoring the base of Abu Dhabi. And so with that, I think you've got a lay of the land about what we're going to be talking about for the next few hours. You've got a sense both from a global perspective, from a firm perspective, from a theme perspective, but critically you see that in the end it's about people and it's about people connecting and working together. And so thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you, James.